everybody. Can you hear me okay? So hopefully you are here for our panel discussion of finding the narrative in numbers. Um, got an awesome uh, exercise panel here. Uh, we've got a lot of different diverse opinions from our experts. Um, before I introduce them, quick show of hands. How many people have seen one of their great talks from earlier today? Okay, a lot of people. Uh, how many have seen two talks? S pretty much the same number of hands went up. How many have seen all, all talks? Like you've been in this tent pretty much all day except for lunch. Okay, much smaller group of people. So we're gonna do a quick introduction uh, and then we're gonna jump into the questions. So on the stage, uh, feel free to raise your hand or stand up. I'm just gonna say a quick line about each of you. Uh, starting off, we have Casey. He's a product advisor with a focus on growth. Uh, we also have Gabriel, who works on the data side of the BBC. Zach, who's the CEO of Helpfully, which is the product team for Hire. Matt, who's product at Cloudera. Paul, who's product, ad product advisor for small and medium companies. And Lindsay, who's a data-centric PM on at Spotify, Shopify, excuse me, Shopify. Okay, did I leave anybody out? Great, so we're on product here. Let's, let's start by defining the problem. We're here to talk about uh, finding the narrative in numbers. So Paul, you're a little, a little bit ahead of the game here. Um, you wrote an article on this topic earlier. Um, and my takeaway from that article was that really success in finding the narr narrative in numbers is finding the right thing to build. And that could probably be generalized to finding a way to narrow focus. So question, first of all, question for you, is that your takeaway from your article? And then for the group, uh, can we agree to that definition or amend it? Uh, actually, the, when I was writing the article, it was, it was basically, uh, when I mentor a lot of product managers, I haven't asked them, you know, what metrics are you trying to change? Like, uh, it comes back to the OKRs. Like, what, what are the objectives, what are the key results? And oftentimes, they'll give me some vanity metrics, which is like, increase uh, sales or increase uh, engagement, remove churn, and it's like, okay, but can you tell me a little bit what are the indicators you're gonna be looking at? You know, like, uh, there is no Google Analytics function for churn. So how are you gonna get there? And it's like, well, my data guy is gonna give it to me. And, and I often find that as a product manager, your responsibility is to quantify the number yourself. Just at bare bones, open up an Excel spreadsheet and weekly or daily, just go and grab the numbers you need to look at in order to have a discussion with the data scientist so this way at some point they can automate it. So uh, I always ask, what are your five finger metrics? And uh, the five fingers means like you need to find five reasons, five numbers you're gonna look at for this particular feature. And just to get you to think a little bit further than uh, oh, increase the number of tra the number of visitors, or you know, increase like what funnel are you trying to create, and what are you trying to quantify, and what's going to be in your spreadsheet, and once that's been defined, then it's easy for you to have conversation with other people because now you're trying to associate these five finger metrics to a narrative that's in your head that you're going to go and repeat to other people to either prove that things are going well or basically realize that things aren't going as well as expected and you need to pivot on the, for those features. So that's kind of the, the direction I was, I was heading with that article. Didn't even answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question, sorry. Um, uh, so can we, in, in terms of finding a success, what success is for yeah. finding the, the narrative in numbers, is that, is narrowing focus success? Um, I like the idea of narrowing, n narrowing focus. Um, how I might describe that kind of process at a company, though, is really um, the meaningfulness behind the numbers. I think sometimes we naively go into those conversations where we assume that the numbers are facts. These are going to be facts about the world. And I come from a more interpretivist kind of place. And so I would say it's very important for product teams to find that ground level agreement, even if that's not ground truth. It is ground truth for us, for our product, for this feature, for now. And, and it's, I, I just, when you say find focus, I think that's probably a good definition, but I think it's also find agreement um, because the conversation and the agreement that I think Paul was alluding to 
is very valuable, I think the conversation might even be more valuable than the numbers that you find. Totally, totally wrong, yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so actually, agreement is super important, obviously. Um, even in a, a small product team that we have, uh, we, ch we struggle with that. But a couple other areas I've also seen um, where we've applied uh, numbers, where we've applied telemetry on the usage of our product <laughs> to making decisions, not just what's the next thing to build or even what's the thing to maintain or, or, or lower investment in, but other things would be like, what's the right uh, SKU packaging to use? So we have a situation where our SKUs are kind of virtual. It's really just, there's no physical representation of them. It's what the customer gets support on, for example, of, of a given product, or uh, what, just what we charge them for. Uh, we don't really necessarily unlock additional specific features, but we might understand um, why a couple of different you know, data engines are useful together through data and then say, you know, it makes sense because people tend to use these together to build a SKU, a discount, and package it that way. Um, another thing would just be understanding consumption to direct your, your sales force to go and renew them or try to upsell them. You know, we know that they're at 90% capacity on data or in compute. So we predict at this point they're going to be ready for a renewal, and that's when we'll, we'll um, flag that for the sales team to go and, and sell them more. So there's other decisions you can make um, as an organization, you know, based on uh, based on this this telemetry data that are um, in addition to you know just what to build. Nice. Yeah, on on finding focus, um, I think in general with the companies I work with, it's a big problem. Uh, Product teams always have eyes that are bigger than their stomach. So after I left Pinterest, I, I met up with the CFO uh, the following year, and he was like, OK, so here are the 10 strategic priorities of Pinterest this year. And I stopped him, and I said, that means you have zero strategic priorities. Like, I know this company. There's no way we could do 10 things extremely well. And but that's what most companies try to do. And then it, inevitably, because you can't do 10 things well, there is competition among different product teams as to which of those priorities really are priorities. Uh, and just back to the earlier conversation on metrics, um, you know, we have like a, a joke in the growth community of if you're just optimizing like general generic engagement metrics or vanity metrics, in a year you'll either be a gambling site or a porn site because that's what drives like the most engagement on the internet. So you have to really tie your metrics to the mission of the company, which means they can't be these vanity things like signups or downloads. They have to be like these very specific metrics that map to why your company exists, like which, what value you're trying to provide. And uh, getting alignment around those key metrics is super important to then actually ship things across the company that are valuable. Actually, on that topic, one of the things that I try to always do is let's say there's an initiative starting, or we're talking about an initiative, and I usually try to force it to like, there's only four metrics, like top high level metrics that you gotta basically try to aim for and then work your way down. And those are, you're either trying to earn more money, you're either trying to incrementally earn more money out of existing customers, you're either trying to optimize something in the software that's gonna in decrease cost, which is ultimately a margin improvement for the company, or you're building intellectual property that can be leverageable down the line. It's, it's those four, that's it. Like you gotta choose from those four. I know there's exceptions, but those are pretty much 90% of the metrics that most company objectives can align on. And from that point, you can find your focus on what are the non-vanity elements that I need to keep track of, which align with decreasing cost, optimizing um, the, com the company uh, things, or on the other hand, acquiring new customers so this way we make more money. But it always comes down to money. I, I mean, like as a product guy, you're responsible of finding ways for the company to save money or make money. Um, and if you're not computing that in what you're doing and for some, some, some humanistic cause, you're doing it for the best interest of the end user, then you're not, I mean, you might be a very good user experience designer, but you're not a good product manager because you're being quantified on your ability to raise you know, the most important metric in business, which is revenue. No. Actually, um, coming from a public service broadcaster, I would disagree with that. Yeah, Our business too. model is actually quite good. Our business model is either you pay our license fee or we put you to prison, which is quite convincing. But actually, that's not what we can optimize for. So we care a lot about how willing you are to email your MP or something like that to actually fight for the existence of a license fee and how much you actually enjoy the brand. And actually, that is quite an interesting challenge for us because sometimes the, um, the general 
vanity metrics are a bit more important for us because for us, we know that we need to reach a certain percentage of the UK population in order to make sure that they, there's enough voices to fight for the universality of the, uh, the license fee. So I think while I genuinely agree that vanity metrics are a bad thing, you do sometimes run into these edge cases where actually it's all about the vanity metrics because it's all about the size in order to be able to own a certain part of the population that then gets you that leverage that you need on your politicians. Yeah, and I think focusing on revenue isn't always the right goal. You know, from uh, my framework, essentially, if you create user value, once you create it, it's much easier to start capturing value yourself. And a lot of the startups I work with, they're trying to monetize too aggressively early on before they've even proven if they have something that's working. And of course, you know, I, I talk with the benefit of like usually venture capital backing that allows me to delay monetization a little bit. But uh, I, I think it's better if your key metrics are aligning towards, is there something valuable that's happening here? Um, and then of course the follow-up question is, will I now or in the future be able to monetize that in a sustainable way to be successful as a company? Wow, that's great. Started to get a little bit of controversy going. That's what we want. Just polite. That's what, you want. That's what I want. I'm biased. Um, could, is anyone interested in talking a little bit about how finding the narrative and numbers is unique in your industry or in your company? Kind of a unique flavor that you bring to it? Because we've got a, a broad array of backgrounds here. Yeah, so actually, I, I first want to talk about, in my view, actually, narrative is sometimes more important than the numbers. Um, I've had discussions with uh, providers of reporting software where basically they had run a, um, a kind of a questionnaire with a lot of their CEO and uh, C-level executives uh, of their customers and they asked them the, qu the simple question, if your gut feeling tells you one thing and your data tells you something else, what do you believe? And 70% of them said, I'm going to believe my gut and I'm going to ignore the data. And that is something that's quite prevalent in a lot of the less data-driven or technology-driven businesses, and a lot of us still work for, you know, those organizations that are not necessarily the Facebooks, the Googles, the Pinterest, or anything like that. And actually having a strong narrative that allows the executive to jump onto that, and then having the data to support that, in my view, is often actually more important than having a data that is kind of taken out of context that nobody understands. We tend to be quite unique uh, as product managers, data people, whatever, that we think about data in a very different way for a lot of people that kind of have other business functions, data can sometimes be quite constraining and can be considered a bit kind of scary. It can be seen as the opposite of creativity and you need to take them along on that journey. And I think actually narrative therefore is almost more important than what metrics you use around them. Actually, it's funny because you're right. It's, uh, you gotta sell the data. You gotta sell the data to the executive team. You gotta sell the data to the to CEOs and oftentimes you gotta, you gotta tell it with a nice story. But no, it's not unique to product managers. Uh, I mean, like, the sales team is selling their data, their sales funnel. The marketing team is selling their data. And you're, you're basically, like, in this position where, for, in order for the product to move forward, you got to sell your data as well, right? And your data is always comes into com number of customer increase, number of churn uh, preventions, uh, engagement numbers going up. I mean, that's the data you got to talk about. But you got to, you still need to, try to figure out how to get that data and keep it to yourself so this way you can build the narrative you want. I don't think data scientists, like they're there to help, but they're crunching other types of data. You gotta crunch your own numbers, right? And figure out exactly how you're gonna build your story using those numbers. Okay. Um, Lindsay, sorry to put you on the spot here, but could you talk a little bit about how Shopify, so I'd imagine uh, e-commerce, like a lot of data-driven stuff, but could you talk a little bit about the non-data elements that you to drive your narratives? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I have, an, I have an answer for the last question. Oh, go for it. <laughs> uh, so one thing I was going to say was um, how we present the data is actually really unique. Uh, so I run a multidisciplinary team of SEO people and photographers and developers, and I realized no one was ever checking our metrics. So we started uh, putting them all up on a whiteboard where literally every single day a different person from the team has to update our KPIs. And I found that's been really powerful for getting everyone aligned around like the same feedback loops because it's very tangible if you're updating a whiteboard and behind goals. Uh, and then you asked about non-data. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Uh, qualitative data, so user testing. How do you use kind of other inputs other than raw data to, to drive the narratives? Sure, yeah. So uh, one thing we did recently was uh, our stats had been dropping, so one of our KPIs out of nowhere just dropped, and we didn't know why. 
So at like 5.01 p.m., I shipped a chat bot on the site, and I just started talking to users and trying to figure out why they weren't able to download photos. And I learned a ton. It turned out uh, we had way more international traffic uh, in the recent weeks, and they just simply couldn't find the keywords they were looking for. But I found that in a couple hours of talking to random site users as opposed to uh, waiting and doing formal research. Um, yeah. Um, so for the audience, quickly, uh, if you're looking on Slido on your phone, please put your questions in. Hopefully, we'll have some time to get those going at the end. But it's great to get those going now while you're while you're thinking about them, so we can get that ready early. Um, Gabriel, quick question for you. So you talked a little bit about some of the issues caused by data silos in BBC. Could you could we talk about the prerequisites for kind of being able to mine numbers to get that narrative out of it? Like, what do we, what do we need to have first in order to, to get that information? Uh, so what I generally find the biggest challenge at the beginning is the ability to ask good questions. Um, and it's not really a data problem, it's more of a, if you want a product problem. And it's the same around data science, right? Actually, the writing the algorithms is the easy part of data science. It's formulating your business problem in such a way that you can mathematically do something about it, and then afterwards being able to convince the organization to follow it. That's the problem. And I think the same applies to, to data. It's having the ability to ask questions where you don't necessarily have a pre-formulated answer that you're looking for. So you're not just trying to confirm that you've been right, but you have a hypothesis that you're willing to give up. Uh, and kind of having that scientific approach to testing or to, to, to figuring something out about your business, I think is a, is a really challenging bit. Once you have that, you then know what kind of data to bring together. And in big inverted commas, it's just an engineering problem. It's a problem that's solvable that you've done beforehand. But the problem at the beginning is really trying to figure out what is the question that I need to ask. Can I ask a follow-up to that? What's the team of people that is in the question asking part of the conversation as opposed to the question answering part of the conversation at, at BBC? I think like uh, most of these things, right, it, it's different teams depending on the questions. Um, so the way that we have structured is we have one technology organization and then we have a separate organization called marketing and audiences. Uh, funny enough, M&A, which in most organizations means something else. Coming back to this, actually, we don't care about profit or revenue in the same way as other places. Um, and they, a lot of the classical questions that we tend to ask ourselves is, as we were a linear TV broadcaster is, is this the right program on the right spot and did we advertise it in the right way? And kind of there you bring together the three different parts, right? You bring together the schedulers who worry about when are we going to show it. You bring together the program producers or content producers who worry about what is being produced and you bring together the advertising people who are trying to tell people that this thing actually exists. So I think it really depends on what the problem is. You probably want someone who understands the problem space and ideally, you want someone who can help formulate that question, which ideally is the same person, but realistically often isn't. Interesting. Um, Casey, question for you. So you talked in your talk a bit about Grubhub and how they found a particular point at which uh, if a user searched for a number of restaurants, they found that that would really increase their, their chance of activating. Um, how can we find those really key pieces of data? Sure. Uh, you know, so I wish I could tell you in that particular example, we asked the perfect question out of the gate. Um, but just the reality is we're constantly asking questions, constantly doing analyses, some of which produced interesting correlations like that and some of which did not. Uh, but mainly the way uh, in my career that I found the interesting questions to ask is by talking to users. So, you know, in the case of you know, Grubhub, when we talk to users uh, in the early days, you know, it'd be like, oh, I don't really get the importance of using this versus just like using the menus in my drawer, right? And then what follow up out of that was like, well, one of the differences between the menu in your drawer and Grubhub is that like we can show like 100 plus restaurants that would deliver instead of the eight that you think filter you, right? So then it was like, okay, can we prove that? And then, you know, we ran the analysis and the first time we screwed the analysis up and then I reran it and then sort of, like, oh, in Chicago, this pops out. Oh, in Boston, this pops out. And then in every market, we had like a reproducible trend. Um, but in pretty much all cases, it usually comes from talking to users. Um, and in some cases, talking to employees and understanding their hypotheses. And then finding a way, A, can you track that? <clears throat> Originally, when this hypothesis came up, we weren't tracking how many results we were showing to each individual user. So then we had to go add the tracking and then doing the analysis and seeing uh, if there's actually something interesting there. Yeah, that really seems to tie back to this of 
Where do the questions come from? There's also the, you know, there's the time where you're sitting in front of whatever numbers you got, like whatever dashboards you're looking at, and just like looking at them from various angles, right? And just trying to understand what the hell's going on here, which basically like makes you take a few screenshots of something and you don't know what it is. Then you go back to internal employees in the company and ask, what caused this? What, what's going on here? And you're right, you go back to users and you're gonna ask them. But so, you know, it's like, it's either you go to users and then follow it up with data or you go with the data and follow it up with user, users in order to validate because the data might tell you something but you don't know. It might be the Super Bowl and somehow numbers went through the roof and you can't correlate Super Bowl and that data on the data sheet but somehow a user's gonna just say, duh, it's the Super Bowl, right? And, and suddenly like the story starts making sense, right? Um, going back to that theme we talked about earlier of um, kind of you can make the story that you want kind of given given sufficient data like what responsibility do the creators of these narratives have um, a to kind of point out data points that don't agree with their narrative and B to make sure that they course correct when they figure out their narrative is maybe wrong so related, I think, is just keep an open mind um, because it's, like, like we said, it's, it's important to be able to be proven wrong uh, by the data if you have a hypothesis. But what you find may actually have nothing to do with the original question you were trying to ask. So a funny example we had is uh, my previous company, an analytics product. We're analyzing web traffic for a social network and the presence all around the world. We're looking at affiliates and who's driving traffic to their site. Um, so where are the inbound referrals coming from, and so what partners should we focus on, and affiliates, and how well are they doing, how much should we care? And we actually found that for one product in particular, all the traffic was not just coming from one place, but one server in Canada, even though they have presence around the world. Canada has been no means their largest market. And it turned out they had a misconfigured network. So they're actually driving and routing all the traffic from all their countries through this one machine in Canada, which is actually a huge problem for their IT department in terms of the stress it was putting on their network. They have hundreds of millions of users. And, um, and so just from doing this basic analysis, finding this, having the raw data, not using some cloud service provider that kind of pretties it up into reports, we're able to do this, this diagnosis and actually fix a, an IT problem. It had nothing to do with what we, were, what we were trying to ask. So keep an open mind when you look at the data to be, you know, to be disproven or to have it take you in a completely different direction. Yeah, I think one of the ways I might describe that is um, kind of like system one, system two. So thinking very fast and thinking about today's reality and then that more system two, slow, reflective, more strategic set of conversations that's happening at the company. And I think in meetings, right, I've seen people pop back and forth. We bolted um, a self-service product onto an existing uh, data products business. And so they had some very specific KPIs and measures of today's business, but because we were also broadening the user population, broadening who was gonna buy data from, from these guys by, by bolting it on, we were really in like a long-term conversation, but trying to decide that from short-term metrics or looking very close and granularly at today's business, and you can't answer tomorrow's problems with today's data, if that makes sense. Yeah, I can answer this question from a few different angles. So for yourself, I really like Bezos' philosophy of strong opinions weekly held. So I'm gonna have an opinion about where this thing should go, but I am very open to data that will dissuade me. Uh, the question really is how can you scale that to the rest of the organization? And I think there's like two main areas. Uh, one is driving strong alignment on what every employee is there to do. Uh, and when you don't have that, then everyone builds their own narrative in terms of what's important and what's gonna make. If you can optimize for the company, you start optimizing for yourself. Uh, and even when you can optimize for the company, uh, it needs to be proven to you that optimizing for the company is more important than optimizing for yourself. So um, getting really good at driving that alignment and showing like, you know, hey, if we all align on this, then it's greater returns for everyone is a pretty strong motivator. But people re respond to incentives. And if those incentives uh, create what I would call like local optimization, where like what gets me promoted is the most important thing that matters versus what makes the company an extra billion dollars is the most important thing that matters, 
that's when you run into uh, some issues. An, an example of this that I've seen a lot is I spend some time in VC at Greylock, and people be like, oh, what do you think about like all these MarTech companies, like marketing technology? And I'd be like, well, in short, I hate them because anyone who works in marketing's job is to just look good to the CMO, and most marketing technology providers just tell you you're not doing a very good job, then no one wants to buy them. It's like, I'm gonna buy an attribution tool that tells me I'm really terrible at spending money on performance marketing. I don't wanna buy that, it's gonna get me fired. It's not gonna get me promoted, right? Um, and that's because like most marketing teams aren't properly aligned or incentivized, right, in, in the way that they grow their career. So thinking really hard, whether you're a CEO, a product leader, et cetera, about how you drive that alignment and how you structure the incentives so that people are gonna have strong opinions weekly held instead of, you know, I'm the progressive web app guy and it's all in on progressive web app, I don't care what the data says, I'm gonna structure the story around that versus apps, like, then you have a problem. One of the strong opinions weekly held um, things that we've done in small companies at startups is we actually have had founders all put their money where their mouth is. So we had them bet on what metrics would go in which directions based on various either permutations in the sales funnel side or in the core product. Like, oh, this will work, right? At, at, at percentage X. I don't know, we just had them say like, I put my, you know, so we just built a, a like a betting board so they could bet. Um, and what's cool if you, if you sort of play that out, I think even very experienced people aren't actually good at predicting what users will do, right? The, the, the actual predictive power of your 25 years of experience as a sales professional will not accurately show what would happen in a given A, B test, right, of a product. And so this is like a really fun way to take the narrative out of I'm very smart, we know what users need and want, we understand what drives them to purchase and moves it into a, huh, that's an interesting finding, but we're all, on the board, as it were. So it's not necessarily calling people out. It's really about encouraging a conversation. And so just putting like $1 bills on the cork board is, is one way to do that. Now I find that you're often put on the spot as a product person to own that narrative with the numbers. So, you know, just repeating, um, I'm often wrong. <laughs> I might be wrong, and I'm often am. And then going into your narrative, at least, at least keeps a culture of an open-mindedness about like there's nothing exact in this you know you were just making assumptions validating him and maybe the the whatever we know as a as a narrative at this point might be right but the sample size is too small and there's you know there's a lot of factors in at play here so so creating that culture of uh of never really you know just realizing you're going to hedge your bets and you're going to hedge them wrong sometimes but I always say in baseball to hit for 300. I know this is an Eastern European country, so you guys might not be big baseball fans, but uh, go Red Sox. Uh, in, in, in baseball, you got to strike out seven times out of 10 to have a 300 average. And a 300 average is actually considered a successful average. So, so you know, you're not going to get them all right. You're not, your job isn't to get them all right. Your job is to have a good average. Yeah, I over-index on uh, trust, purpose, and organization. And I don't actually spend very much time writing briefs because I want my team to be highly aligned. And then from there, they can pivot if needed. And we also celebrate wins like over the top. So right now, actually, they're launching a rocket in a park somewhere in Canada because they hit a ridiculous goal. And that's the reward that they chose. That's great. Literally launching a rocket. That's so, Canadian. Um, so we're going to do one last question, and then we're going to go to the Slido. So as a product manager, one thing that I worry about on the narrative on my products is doing A-B tests and really just moving to local maxima rather than global maxima. And by that I mean kind of ignoring the potential radical changes that changes to my product could, could get. What are some, some ways to avoid that? Yeah, so we had this problem at Pinterest. So we had a uh, conversion optimization team and uh, we had a fairly successful strategy which we called GIF wrap, which is as you start scrolling on a page, a modal will come up from the bottom and eventually block you and ask you to sign up. And through this strategy, we 5 x our conversion rate over time, and the team who initially was resistant to it eventually really identified with that strategy. But over time, uh, you, know, you start getting less and less gains in your future experiments. 
So uh, I made a rule that said if we have three experiments in the same strategy that are showing declining wins or no wins, then we automatically have to spin up another team to challenge that strategy. Mm. So we essentially end up splitting the team in two. We had the optimization team and the diversion team. The, di the diversion team is working on the same long-term KPI, uh, which is conversion rate, uh, you know, activated signups. But they're going to take more time. They're going to do less experiments. They're going to be doing more research uh, to get to something that hopefully will crush the existing strategy. Uh, and that definitely you know, took a while to get the team bought in, but eventually it became very clear what each team was doing and why there wasn't any kind of uh, you know, battling between the teams as to what was right. They both are trying to optimize the same metric. It's just time frame. Uh, and so that's something that's worked for me. And I think one of the things in, in any experiment that you need to be thinking about, which I mentioned a little bit in my talk, is are you optimizing or are you diverging? And you, as a product leader, uh, at a point you need to make a call or say, hey, we're going to continue optimizing, but we're going to start spending some resources on divergence, or else you'll never reach that global maxima. Yeah. All right. Slido is up. Uh, and we're just about out of time, so I think maybe one Slido question. Um, oh, I pick. I'm going to go top, top rate. How to solve the tension between short and long term? What to do when you have the numbers and the narrative that point to the latter? Decision strategy makers opt for the former cash cow approach. I'm not sure I understand this question, but that's a, that's a, that's. A, that's a, oh. uh, well, I think there's a little bit more to it, right? Which is, so that the example I gave was when I actually had control of everything. I think in this example, you want to optimize for the long term. Your CEO or whatever does not, right? And I think in general, uh, you know, when you're whether you're on a product team or whatever. You have to put points on the board to earn the right to do longer term strategies that are going to play out lo longer. So when I joined Pinterest, I didn't have a lot of authority. You know, people were like, who is this guy from the Midwest from some startup that we don't use because, you know, we don't use, we don't use products that aren't invented in Silicon Valley. Um, and I had to go move the conversion rate with some, you know, short term tactical stuff, which is what gift wrap was. And then eventually through building up credibility through that, I was able to say like, hey, this goal you've given me, signups, is actually a stupid fucking goal. And what we actually want is engaged users. And I want to like pull down some of these walls and do more education and you know, get people to actually maybe drop the sign up metrics in the short term and increase engaged users in the long term. So you have to figure out when you have the credibility to do that as a, as a product leader, as a product manager. And you might not have it now, so you have to like go put points on the board and build up more of that credibility to be able to come back and prove out the strategy uh, for the long run. The other thing I would think about is um, for each executive on your team, there are probably different ways of communicating them that's going to get the message across. So Ben, our, our CEO at Pinterest, if you didn't frame the value, if you didn't frame what you were doing in terms of the impact to the user, it just didn't register. Like if you said something about, oh, this is going to help the business grow by X, he's like, I don't understand what that means. Like, tell me what you're doing for the pinner, or like, get the fuck out of my office. Um, so I had to like learn how to like reframe all my arguments around that. Whereas our VP of product, like, literally data, data, data. Like before you could get your first sentence out in a product review, he'll ask you five data questions. If you didn't know the answers to all five, it'd be like, why the fuck are we here? Go back when you know what you're talking about. So you're going to have to like spend some time as a product manager understanding who's the different audiences and how do you optimize the narrative for each of them so that you can actually you know, get them bought into, the, in this case, the long-term strategy. I don't know. Those were some things that worked for me. Happy to hear from others. Yeah, I mean, bring, bring better numbers. Be, a, be, be more convincing. Um, the executives who are choosing the cash cow strategy are doing so for a reason. Like the ca like cash cow, that's a number. That's revenue that you're getting today from these customers, right? And obviously, you have to balance uh, revenue against forward-looking revenue if you want to re-architect something completely. So we're looking at this right now in terms of converting our product to be more cloud-native customers that are running on much newer sort of cluster management software versus running on bare metal or, or earlier days of earlier phases of virtualization. 
how much do we optimize for those different deployment styles uh, because there's more money right now in the, in, the, um, in the older technologies and there's more money in the future in the newer technologies. But um, I would just say that you, know, um, you also have to have a lot of discipline in terms of understanding what the decision criteria should be. It's not the number of committers or the number of users of a, a, a technology per se out there. It's amongst your customer base that you're targeting with the sales force that you have today and your ability to reach that market. You know, what are people willing to pay for these things over time? That's what you need to look at, um, uh, not the, the vanity metrics that might make it really attractive. Certainly, if you come in with a bias, like as an engineer, you want to use the latest stack and you want to just burn everything down and rebuild it. That's the natural instinct of things. Um, you really have to have a good balance by, by bringing all the right numbers to, to the decision and then, as was well said, adapt to the audience that you're talking to. All right, actually, can we, sorry, can we wrap up? We're a little bit over time. Uh, could we get a round of applause for our awesome panel here? <laughs> and I've been asked to share with you all that if you signed up for one of the uh, free stuff contests that's going on, you want to head over to the Amuse tent, and that's where the prizes will be. So head on out. Thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, can we get one more, one more round of applause? So.